you have to, you can still eat. And follow both events on hashtag Ottawa Health Law uh, for live tweets from our maestro of tweeting, <laughs> Professor Lorian Hardcastle. Okay, well, thank you very much. Merci pour l'invitation de, de présenter aujourd'hui. Uh, je peux parler un peu de français, mais c'est pas juste. Uh, je vais vous présenter en anglais, mais si vous voulez poser des questions en français, peut-être je peux comprendre. So it's a pleasure to be here in the, in the capital, and it's a great time to be here, given the uh, election campaign going on, which is, and this one is pretty fascinating. And as you probably know, and we'll talk about that in the pub tonight, about the, the federal role in the more immediate terms. And Colleen, when she uh, invited me to do this in Lorianne, I said, so what do you want to talk about? And I said, the Canada Health Act, does it matter much? And Colleen almost did this apologetically thinking, you know, you might have a better topic. But actually, I think this is a cool topic. Now, I, I am wading into your territory here. Uh, Martha was very kind in describing my work as scholarship. I'm, I'm a part-time fake academic. I'm not a real one. So, so it's not, it's not, I'm not going to give you a particularly professorial take on this. And also, my, my training is political theory, not law. So I'm going to talk about law like I know something about it. <coughs> and you'll catch that immediately uh, that I don't. Uh, but I kind of have to in order to make sense of this topic. So I've just slightly amended the topic, uh, as these things get amended when you think about them. So does it matter? Can it? And then should it, I think, is, is an important part of it. Whoops. So in a sense, it's not a question, right? I mean, the, the, I, I could just say, sure. Yeah, it matters. If we didn't have it, things would be a little bit different. And case closed. You know, it, gets, it, it, un, it opens the tap for federal money to flow to the provinces. And it says a few things about what the provinces mainly can't do. Uh, so I in that narrow sense, it means something. But remember what the Canada Health Act is. I mean, most of you will not remember its predecessor. <coughs> but the Canada Health Act was just kind of a fairly modest and, uh, amendment to the 1966 Medical Care Act, which was the big kahuna. And the reason it was modified, I'll get into in a minute, but as, as a piece of legislation, don't think that 1984 was a starting point. 1984 was actually halfway through the evolution of what was the Medical Care Act and all of its aspirations on the way to a much attenuated version of the national dream about Medicare. And this was kind of a, you know, it was like you're on a highway, this is a rest station um, with limited services and so-so food. <laughs> so <clears throat> it's not that big a deal, which doesn't mean you should leave right now because this conversation doesn't matter. You, you can figure that out later. Uh, so the thing about laws, of course, is that they, they always originate and unfold in a context, and sometimes they have intended consequences and sometimes unintended. So what is the historical context? Well, this is it. Uh, Medicare was, I would argue, the crowning social program achievement of what I would describe as Canadian post-war optimism. After the war, uh, that's World War II, um, there was a, government was still a highly reputable institution. The country had really found its feet. Uh, there was a massive influx into the universities and later a massive expansion. Uh, it was a sunny period, actually. It was in, in Canadian history, and governments naturally felt entitled to do things, uh, particularly the federal government. Now, my province, Saskatchewan, originated the two programs that resulted in the first Hospital Services and Diagnostic Act of 1957, which essentially provided for hospital insurance as we know it as part a fundamental part of Medicare. Ours began in 1948, and then uh, with, the, with the HIDS Act of 1957, uh, it was the legislation that enabled it to spread across the country. That was relatively uncontroversial, although some provinces grumbled a little bit about it because of affordability. The next one was more cataclysmic. In 1962, 
uh, 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 Saskatchewan implemented the uh, Medical Care Insurance Act, which insured physician services and brought them into the fold. This occasioned a massive, massive fight, uh, a 23-day doctor's strike, astonishingly vicious rhetoric against Medicare uh, by, by a large groups of people. The physician community was utterly divided. We airlifted physicians from Britain to set up community clinics in Saskatchewan, and some communities literally remained divided over the issue of Medicare for at least two decades. Uh, it was quite a volatile thing, and I would argue it was the last thing anyone ever really thought about in Canadian health care. I think it took the stuffing out of future battles, to tell you the truth. And there was a major concession on July 23, 1962, when Lord Taylor engineered an end to the strike, essentially by persuading the government that it had to allow doctors essentially to be contractors to the health care system on a fee-for-service basis. And we have lived with either the virtues or the defects of that compromise ever since. Uh, that's a bit of an aside, but it just shows you the, the tenor, the, the, the temper of the times. Also, uh, three large provinces were vehemently opposed to extending physician services uh, under Medicare. Uh, they just thought it was an irresponsible thing to do. There were philosophical objections and also financial objections, but if, interestingly enough, the times were so different, it's not like the federal government had a massive majority. It was a minority government led by Lester Pearson that got this done, and it was a true act of leadership in the cabinet. If you ever want to read a story, it, Google Alan J. McKechn and his account of how it got passed in the cabinet. Uh, finally, Pearson just said, we're doing this. Never mind what the, the, uh, the uh, wind was telling us as we stick our finger into it. It was the right thing to do. So. In terms of law and, and the Constitution, um, both of these acts are very good exam examples of how, regardless of what the Constitution says and what it assigns to which level of government, the federal government can always pay to play. That is, if the federal government wants a role in something, absent something that would be challenged successfully in the courts by somebody, uh, if the federal government wants to do a program, and it wants to do a program in an area where the provinces have responsibility. All it has to do is say, we'll put up some money, and it gets done. So if we're going to come to any kind of provisional conclusion about whether the Canada Health Act means what it should, uh, we have to have some idea what we want laws to achieve. And again, this is your terrain, not mine. But as a citizen uh, and as someone interested in politics, it seems to me that some laws are quite grand in the best sense of the term. So the U.S. Constitution is quite grand, and the Charter of Rights is quite grand. And these kinds of laws not only help to define what we are, uh, in other words, they transcend their literal content, they have a certain aspirational, inspirational dimension, and, they're, and living laws are in play. That is, they are, for better or for worse, invoked they are brought to bear on proceedings. Uh, they define, constrain, enable policy, but they are also the subject of litigation from time to time. So these are, these are kind of A-level a laws. Uh, and the, I think in its time, the Medical Care Act of 1966 was such a law. And often what makes them an A-level law is that they are motivated by a philosophy. And, and you hear the term, the spirit of the law and that the spirit of the law is actually important, that it means something to people, even if it is not, uh, if it doesn't tell you what the technical meaning of that law might be, but it, it expresses something collective that is important to enshrine. Often this is in the preamble, you know, the we the people, that kind of thing. Others are important, but they're much more purely technical and administrative and financial. They're the, they're the machinery of public policy and government. And those are also important laws, and some of them may be quite monumentally important, but they're not quite the same. I'd say they're, they're not, they, 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 don't, they don't enter our psyches, or they don't have a place in our psyche that is quite so important as something like, say, the Charter would be. Now, the thing about important laws that, that began with a spirit and a motivating uh, vision 
is that they can, that can either be sustained or attenuated over time because it's no longer a guiding force that, that transcends the mechanics. So if that's the genus of laws, uh, what species is the Canada Health Act? Well, first of all, the Canada Health Act, be, it, w it was passed in a certain circumstance, and it wasn't ex nihilo. It was really an amendment or a clarification of the earlier Medical Care Act of 1966. Now, the proximate cause was that the practice of extra billing, which is, uh, which Medicare says is a no-no, meaning when you go to the physician or you go to the hospital, you're not supposed to be charged additionally for services. But physicians, when they got unhappy with the fee schedule and their income started extra billing, provincial governments were supposed to nix the, the, the practice, but they were a bit lax, especially Ontario. So the government of the day, which was 1984, and again for political context, this was as Trudeau was winding down his long prime ministership, he took his long walk on leap day of 1984 and decided to quit. So then it was succeeded and the Liberal government was on its last legs. So among other things, this was something where the, the government said to itself, you know what, we can champion downtrod Canadians by passing some federal legislation that puts way more teeth into the extra billing kind of thing. Moreover, we might get some political advantage if we bait the Conservatives into opposing it. The latter, whatever the motivation was, if there was political bait, nobody took it because the Canada Health Act passed unanimously. Uh, and otherwise, it wasn't actually very consequential. There was no big restatement of what Medicare was. There were no ringing debates. So it was, it was relatively modest. And then, if you want inspiration in your laws, I think you would open a little more dramatically than this. You know, often you get the big kahuna statements in the, in the preamble. Well, this is the first clause of the preamble, and I can't even bear to read it to you. It's so tedious. In other words, pardon us, excuse us, we're sensitive, and we're not going to do anything intrusive here. For, so, and we respect the Constitution, and we're just kind of doing stuff because we used to do it, and we're just tightening it up a wee little bit. So, in 1966, uh, this meant a little bit more, of course, because it was saying, yeah, 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 we've got the Constitution. We know Section 91 and 92 as well as you do. We have money. So, we're, but we're going to tell you formally, for the record, we're going to put it in the preamble that we're not screwing the Constitution over by dumping a bunch of money into health care. Perfectly sensible thing to do. But as far as what is this about, it doesn't talk about Canadians have the right to health care. There is a clause in the Act that talks about irrespective of need it's, and so and so, but you have to go way down into it. It's a tedious read. I read it twice in preparation for this talk, and that was the hardest part of doing it, was reading the Canada Health Act. Its mercy is that it's pretty short. So you can read it and make your own judgment about how boring it is. So, in essence, the Canada Health Act, regardless of what it formally says, is what the government wants it to be. I mean, it does confer, like many laws do, uh, power. It's, it's sort of like, as Lorianne and I were talking before, it's kind of like medical staff bylaws. If you read medical staff bylaws, the hospital, the CEO, the board, they have power. They can tell physicians how to practice. They can suspend people. They can say you're not doing your job properly. You have to go for remediation. But nobody ever does it because this is it is theoretical power that is rarely exercised for all sorts of reasons. The Canada Health Act does give the government power, and the formal power is to deduct one dollar in transfer payments for every dollar uh, that is allowed uh, or that takes place in terms of extra billing. So if you go to the doctor, your doctor charges you five bucks extra for the medical service. Um, the province is supposed to account for this report to Ottawa that this happened, and then Ottawa's going to take five bucks away from the transfer payments. And over the years, in all the years of Medicare, there was a period in the 1980s when about 250 some million dollars was deducted uh, from provincial transfers. But there's an out clause, which is that if you, if you, within three years, if you end this heinous practice, we'll give you the money back. So <laughs> you can speed, we're going to fine you a hundred bucks, but if you don't speed, later, we'll give you that money back. That would be a good deal for speeding, right? If you want to test the waters of whether you like the speed limit or not. But anyway, 
250 million sounds like a lot of money, but in the grand scheme of health care, it's not, right? So this was never a big deal, but of course it was a constraint. I mean, it, the, the constraint wasn't that they were all going to allow a bunch of extra billing and, and obliterate the principles, but it did leak. There, there were some kind of leakage, and there's a lot more leakage now than there used to be, and we can get into that later. It's also a very peculiar policing mechanism that I'm going down the road there's in Saskatchewan, there's nobody for 10 miles around. I'm going to crank it up to 120, and then I'm going to report it to you. That's essentially what the self-reporting mechanism was. It sounds crazy in terms of effectiveness, but it kind of makes sense in that you don't want, what is Ottawa supposed to have inspectors posing as patients going to medical offices to see if there's extra billing going on? So they had to have some mechanisms, and this was, this was a reasonable compromise. Now, currently, of course, uh, I don't know if you follow these things, but th it's a much more serious issue, and it's not the form of extra billing that, that a doc's going to charge you 10 bucks extra in the office, but it's in the form of uh, de facto or overt privatization, the purchase of services from private medical clinics where they charge you a facility fee, and they upsell you all sorts of ancillary services that you have to take if you're going to get the publicly financed part of that. The BC government has already identified in an audit of about a three-month period, was it, Colleen, in, in BC, some several million dollars just in a few months in one clinic. And this is absolutely dead solid certain money that was, that was a violation of the Canada Health Act. But the BC government, which is in litigation with this clinic, has not yanked the money back. And says, well, we'll wait to see how the litigation turns out, which doesn't bespeak a lot of confidence in its case in, to some extent. Like, it's a little weird. I, I would have got the money back and uh, say, well, we'll give it, I mean, the government can always give it back again if, and such, but of course, it's a very interesting kind of civility here that maybe Colleen can enlighten us about since she has been somewhat involved in this case. Now, back to the CHA. One of the things that laws can do that confounds the citizenry and creates a certain amount of cynicism is define words in ways that defy common meaning and usage. The Canada Health Act has ringing principles, and the two most substantive principles are accessibility and comprehensiveness. Now, a normal person would define these as, I should get service, in terms of accessibility, I should get services reasonably close to home in a reasonably timely way. But there's no such definition of any sort in the Canada Health Act or any regulations there or in health care. The proportion of your health care that publicly financed, legally mandated Medicare covers is actually very small. And people are always shocked to, to, uh, to find out how little it actually covers. And the letter of the law, uh, even, in terms of accessibility and, and comprehensiveness, again, I may be on thin ice here, but I couldn't find any, has no jurisprudence. No one has ever sued the government because services aren't comprehensive, to my knowledge, or that they're not acceptable. There was the Sheuli case, uh, which is about wait times, but that was a charter case. It wasn't a Canada Health Act case. So here's some examples. Um, according to the Canada Health Act, and it's, or, or what's not in the Canada Health Act, these things aren't medically necessary. Well, of course, they are medically necessary. Drugs are 20% of health care and a huge part of the therapeutic regime. For some people, it's all of their health care. Well, that's not in the Canada Health Act. Rehab isn't in the Canada Health Act either unless it's rehab in a hospital or on order from a physician. So the millions of Canadians who go and get rehab services pay for it themselves because they're not going to wait for the limited supply in the public system. Most aspects of long-term residential care are not medically necessary, which is peculiar if you've been in a long-term residential care facility. These are very, very sick people. Optometric services are not medically necessary, it seems. So uh, if I were too poor to pay for my glasses, I literally wouldn't have found my way here because I have terrible vision. Dental care outside surgery in hospitals is not medically necessary. So there's a certain cynicism in this, right? So when we have these ringing principles that have no meaning uh, beyond sort of a rhetorical place in the law, it attenuates the Canada Health Act's place in the national conversation to a certain extent. Now, it used to be different. Not that the act used to be different, but the meaning used to be different. It, when I started working in the healthcare system in the planning branch of Saskatchewan Health in the 1970s, 
This was a very expansionist era in Medicare. We planned a foot care program. We planned a children's dental program. We planned a home care program. Medicare was getting comprehensive, really. And there's still some of that that hang around, like the Ontario Seniors Drug Plan is not required by the Canada Health Act, but it's a generous program that, that it's universal for all seniors. My province doesn't have such a thing. We used to have first dollar pharmacare. We had pharmacare in Saskatchewan in the 1970s to the mid 80s. All you paid was a dispensing fee, which at the time was two bucks, and the rest was free. By 1990s, it was gone uh, for fiscal reasons and for uncontrolled growth in spending reasons. So we don't have pharmacare anymore. We used to insure optometric, used to insure chiropractic services used to insure pretty much all of long-term residential care except for room and board charge. Now lots of provinces have gotten out of that business. So there was the rise and then there was the fall of Medicare's comprehensiveness and scope and ambition. And because so much care has moved out of hospitals and because there are so many more practitioners in the game, the Canada Health Act covers a much smaller part of the health care continuum than it used to. So again, by definition, by its stasis, it has shrunk in meaning and in importance. <laughs> and then, of course, there's this, federalism. Uh, to say cooperative federalism is at a low ebb is to be understated. There are no first minister's meetings anymore, let alone whether they were going to do anything. This is a long trajectory. This isn't just the current government. The current government is kind of the, the, the nth degree of the decline of cooperative, collaborative federalism that began, I would argue, in the 1970s, and part of it began around Medicare, when the government, which had promised 50 cents of every dollar for hospital and medical services, said, we don't want to be on the hook for half the costs when we don't control any of this, because all it does is create an incentive for provinces to ramp up spending, because for every dollar of increased spending, we have to come up with 50 cents, and they only have to put up with 50, come up with 50. So it's a good deal for them, even if the spending is really uh, out of control. So they said, no, we're moving off that, and I won't go over the long history, but what used to be for the core services a 50-50 arrangement. After the government said, look, we're not gonna fund that, we're gonna, our increases will be formula driven, and then after that they said, you know, we're not gonna put in the money for that, we're gonna give you taxation room. So we're gonna give you tax points, so our cash contribution part will be even less to where we are today where the Fed's put in about 18, 19% in terms of cash. Some people still count the tax points. The provinces don't, of course. Ottawa does. So you look at, <laughs> depending on whose website you go to, you'll find a contribution by the Feds is either 30, 32% or 18 or 19%. It's less. And whether, ta whether the federal argument is correct, I happen to think it is, people don't remember tax point transfers. They just see the pie chart and the niceties are lost on anyone who isn't a wonk with an unusual pathological interest in these kinds of things. And then, of course, the other thing in a pay-to-play system is you, you're not just paying, you want to play. And playing means you, have some, you exert some authority over the, what takes place. So you provide some leadership. You bring the jurisdictions together and you say, look, we should have this kind of program. And maybe we should design it this way because it's good to have a pan-Canadian approach to this. The principle of portability in Medicare means a lot more if you roughly have the same configuration of services and arrangements in, in, in every place where you're in and than if they're all wildly different. And let's come to the table. It's not the feds telling the provinces what to do. It's convening them collaboratively, sometimes saying, look, we've got to have this condition. It's only fair and just and reasonable and then you fight it out. But every attempt to impose conditionality has eroded over time. The last big attempt was in the health accords of 2000, 2003, 2004, where the feds had been uh, promised billions and billions and billions of more dollars in cash transfers after squeezing the life out of their transfers in the 90s. So they talked about you're gonna reduce wait times, you're gonna buy some machines, you're going to do all these things. And everyone says, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they sign the accord, and it's an accord, which sounds like it's an agreement. And then we're going to report on what we did. In the end of the day, the money goes to the provincial consolidated fund. You can't put dye on it that says it's going into the health care system. Nobody did the accounting. Nobody did the reporting anymore, and it just said, fine, we're giving you the money. So there's no federal presence in the configuration of health care anymore. 
I don't think that was necessarily the intent of the government of the day, which was the liberal government of Paul Martin. It is absolutely the intent of the Harper government. The Harper government actually says that's a great idea. All we should do is write checks. But again, whatever you think of it, it has the virtue of clarity. You know, they aspire to nothing and they achieve it in terms of leadership. So tick, tick that one off on we fulfilled our promise and we are true to our philosophy. Like it or not, that's what highly decentralized federalist uh, political theory would tell you to do. Small government, small federal government, devolve, devolve, devolve. And that's what these guys have done. Pharmacare, I think, is a good test case. Again, you can't possibly think that you have a comprehensive health care system without pharmacare. And if you look at the advanced OECD countries, leave out the states, uh, they all cover 60, 70, 80 percent of all pharmaceuticals. We cover half of prescription drugs in this country. So we have a fragmented system, terrible value for money. Every analysis shows you know, rampantly bad utilization, iatrogenic error abounds. 20% of elderly admissions to hospital are due to polypharmacy. We have a whole bunch of third-party insurers who do nothing except pass through money. We've got employers engaged in all of this, having to worry about extended health care benefits, which is, if uh, nothing else, it's kind of a tax on business. There are plausible cases. I mean, you can read them yourselves, but I think they're plausible. Steve Morgan, uh, Gagnon from here, right? Pardon me? Carlton. Oh, sorry, Carlton. He would be here if he were better. <laughs> 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 that, that, you know, if you had universal public coverage, you would get a win-win. You would have much improved prescribing, you would have lower prices, and total spending would decline with fairly modest increases in government spending. I mean, even if total government spending across the country went up by $5 billion, that's 2% of total health care spending. It's not a massive, massive shock to the public purse. And if you compare it to the amount of tax revenue governments have foregone in this country since the mid-90s, it's now in the hundreds of billions of dollars. You could fund this by restoring the GST, which nobody, not no right-wing economist or left-wing economist thought it was a good idea to cut the GST from 7 to 5%. If you put it back to 7 you could fund pharmacare easily, 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 easily. So it's all doable. Everybody who thinks about this uh, who is not a purely anti-government ideologue, thinks pharmacare is a good idea. No government seems to think it's a good idea. What is going on there? Why is this the case? And is it an ideal test case for those, and I have read their work, yours again, about modernizing, updating, putting some teeth in the Canada Health Act. Isn't pharmacare an interesting test case? And I would argue, yes, it is an interesting test case. And why are we where we are? Well, I think this explains the lack of motivation. Most Canadians do have third-party drug coverage, and the 5 to 6 or 7 percent of Canadians who will say it in response to surveys that they have not filled a drug prescription due to financial barriers, that's a lot of people, actually. But it's not enough people to make a political difference, and the kind of people who can't fill the drug prescriptions aren't politically very powerful. So cynically, it doesn't matter a damn in terms of political configurations. Interestingly enough, that's what people said ab at the dawn of Medicare with both hospital and physician care. They, and it was true. Like two-thirds of people had some form of insurance. But the government said that's not nearly good enough. And there's more to it than that. This is a binding national right to a fundamental public service. This is as health care is as much infrastructure as the Canadian Pacific Railway was in 1985. It builds the country. It shows our solidarity to each other. And these weren't crazy left-wing governments. I mean, this is the liberal government of the day doing this, right? So the justice, solidarity, and nation-building arguments that actually resonated with Canadians in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, by now, it's sort of in the middle of a worldwide neoconservative hegemony from the late 70s to, I'm hoping, the early aughts. I think that's over a little bit now. I think we've passed the peak of the neoconservative fascination. But they have changed the political culture. Very few people will say they trust governments to do the right thing compared to 40 years ago. Very few people have much appetite for grand government schemes. The cynical reflex response is government just 
confiscate your money and waste it, and the private sector is way smarter. In healthcare, this is not a particularly solid argument, and I think most governments know it, but nevertheless, that's the zeitgeist we live under. So there's little appetite for doing anything. Um, it, the, the argument for pharmacare today is probably more powerful than the argument for, for Medicare was in 1966, in, in a sense, in terms of need. But there seems to be no political appetite for it. Now, we could talk about the current campaign, and there's a little bit of talk about it and so forth. And moreover, what's weird is it's not a wedge issue. Nobody differentiates the parties in terms of what they're going to do about Medicare, which is shocking, actually. It used to be the huge wedge issue in every provincial election and some federal election. So it's disappeared from the radar. Part of the reason may be that only, I was 10 years old when Medicare and the strike came in in Saskatchewan. I am in the aging demographic. Very, about a third of Canadians, a, a, maybe a quarter of Canadians would have any memory of that, probably fewer than a quarter of Canadians would have any memory of what life was like before Medicare. So it's become part of the landscape. You people, well, most of you, grew up with Medicare. I mean, you never had to think about it. It was just your birthright. But you don't know how it was fought for, and you don't know what life was like without it, which is a great thing. But it also kind of attenuates whether or not you're going to think about it and whether you want to be motivated to improve it. So, pardon my attempt to be clever here, <coughs> I think this is a CHA catch-22. Um, if you could actually breathe life into the CHA and make it the kind of law that was both inspirational and operational, you wouldn't need the CHA. Because you can do through politics. Uh, you don't need to do this by law. Politics is discussion, persuasion, resource allocation. And if the politics were motivated, and it made a difference, and people would mobilize around this, you wouldn't need any legislation. You don't need any legislation to expand Medicare in a province. You don't need any legislation to expand drug coverage. Uh, you don't need federal legislation. You would need provincial legislation. All you need is people who care about it and who want to achieve it, and to hold politicians account for doing it. If the federal government were to kickstart this, you would need a federal government that was committed both in principle and financially over the long haul, because why would you trust a federal government when they can yank back transfer payments unilaterally like they did? You might trust them for five years, and then what? Oh, things are tough. We have to get our house in order. Sorry, we're not going to give you the money. That kind of thing. So you need to trust. You need long-term commitment. You need the federal government and the jurisdictions to jointly assume some liabilities for something that is nation-building or that completes part of the Medicare journey. We don't have any of that anymore. You'd need the provinces that would be willing to be interdependent and to come to the table and accept something that isn't their pure version of something that's desirable, but is a good compromise where, that everyone can sign on to. So you'd have to say, we're not just responsible for ourselves. We have some obligation and solidarity with our other jurisdictions. Provinces are very parochial these days. Nobody wants to adopt what somebody else has done. And that would signify a change in the political culture. And if you had that change in the political culture, you could get it done. And you wouldn't need to do anything with the Canada Health Act. So just to reaffirm, to conclude, the CHA doesn't limit any innovation in Medicare at the provincial level. It truly doesn't. We've seen provinces do things without any change to the Medical Care Act or the CHA, and we've seen them cut things, as long as they observe the very core foundations of the CHA. So now that the CHA has become a ceiling rather than a floor on public financing, I think what that reflects is not anything to do with the law. It, has, it reflects the temper of the times. Provincial governments worried that 35 to 50 percent of their budgets are eaten up by health care. They see no way out of this. In election campaigns in my youth, Healthcare was actually a political asset for the incumbent. You know, governments would say, well, we've built another hospital in North Battleford and we continue to provide physician services to our people and we hug each other and say, yeah, damn, that's lucky the government gets to take credit for that. Then in the 80s, it became a liability. Oh my God, you can just survive the healthcare things. You know what the media is like about healthcare now. It's very negative. Every time there's that something goes wrong, people blame the government. And it's hugely expensive, and it, it's an opportunity cost for governments. So even if governments had changed in the way we might like them to to expand Medicare, I think you could make an argument that they're, they're wise to stay away from health care. We actually have maybe need more money in post-secondary education. 
in other forms of investment, in some other social programs like housing, which the government has gotten out of too. Maybe healthcare is super abundant. Actually, it is. There's a lot of literature about waste in healthcare. So maybe it's not just cynicism, maybe it's prudence. So this is my conclusion. The CHA is an insignificant part of the landscape, and of course you could make it better. You could make a much more robust, toothful Canada Health Act that, was, that people paid more attention to. You could fight about it, you could pass it, you could get it done. The federal government might even score some political points by doing it, to tell you the truth. But, and here's my political scientist hat, legislation's a blunt instrument. You know, one of the flaws in the Medical Care Act and the Canada Health Act is in some ways it was too precise about what you had to do, or insufficiently precise in some areas, but healthcare is a changeable beast. M inpatient to outpatient, different forms of technology, different kinds of professions. You, you don't want to have to unpack the legislation every two years in order to be agile and adapt to the changing healthcare circumstance. So you want it to be mainly about principles and some basic rules, and you want some latitude and flexibility. But if you have a lot of latitude and flexibility, it requires trust and the spirit of the law to be in place in order for it not to be cynically eroded. And we don't have a lot of spirit of the law, I would argue, uh, surrounding this debate. So I don't expect law to do the work of politics and mobilization, and I don't think we should think that CIHA is a, CHA is a very useful crutch to navigate uh, through this. And yes, there is CHA malaise. I think it is kind of a cynically ignored and not very persuasive uh, part of the landscape anymore, but I think that's a result and not a cause of where we are. So I will stop there. Thanks for your attention and over to Martha, who, and you're gonna do a little. Alors merci Stephen, that was formidable, a really great, and I should mention my health law students are here and you're doing my lecture for me, that's excellent presentation. Alors, uh, on a la période de, de questions, comme j'ai mentionné, please speak into the mic so that it can be captured by the uh, people recording this, and I am going to abuse the privilege of being the moderator, and I'm going to start with the first question. So I totally agree with your point, uh, Stephen, that even if we there was the political will to do so, from a determinants of health point of view, it probably wouldn't be a good idea to just go back spending a whole bunch of money on acute health care delivered by physicians in hospitals. So I, I, I absolutely accept that point. But I do have some concerns about the notion of the Canada Health Act as something whose symbolic or hortatory effects have really evaporated. And, and where I'm coming at this from is charter litigation trying to convince uh, courts and of course indirectly governments that access to health care based on need rather than ability to pay is a fundamental right. And that premise of course was challenged in Shaoli and in Oton and it's being challenged now in the Brian Day case. And I actually think that the Canada Health Act puts limits to the, the right of the debate that are very important and that wouldn't be there but for the Canada Health Act. So the, the case I'm trying to make would be, is, is strengthened by being able to make these claims about the Canada Health Act that may not in fact be accurate as a matter of practice. And my case would be dramatically weakened if I couldn't continuously preface my claim, health access to healthcare in Canada is a fundamental social right, and this is reflected, and then I do my list. You know, the International Covenant, the Canada Health Act is always, always almost the first thing in the list, and then I can cite to the accords and everything. So I really, I really want to make a pitch for that, the, the symbolic rather than real effect of the act and the importance of not understating the degree to which it actually stands for something that does have political effects in terms of government's willingness to privatize and the openness of courts to um, challenges to claims to privatization. Thanks. Um, I, I mean, I think those are really important points and um, you may want to come back because I may, I may not understand some of this, um, Martha, but a couple of things. I agree fully that the Canada Health Act 
at times will be invoked in its spirit and symbolism for useful purposes. And I also agree that it does constrain even more erosion uh, of, of what Medicare is supposed to be about. But I think the charter part of it, as you know, I find really quite interesting and intriguing and in some ways at cost purposes. I mean, the Canada Health Act is in a sense redistributionary. It's about distributive justice. It's about a fundamental notion of fairness that the, the core principle being you get service irrespective of, uh, based on your need, irrespective of ability to pay. But of course that is always subject to availability of resources, you have to make trade-offs, you have to consider the greater good. Charter cases tend to be individually based. Sometimes there are groups, group based, but they are much narrower claims to say, I'm entitled to this, which is why there is the notwithstanding clause, that you can, over, not, you know, you can override a charter uh, uh, clause if, it's, if you can establish reasonably that there is a greater good that would be violated if you exceeded. But that, again, when you think that any time something gets into litigation, every time something gets up through the court system, th there is an air or of unpredictability. I was stunned by the Sheuli judgment, actually, as were the <laughs> three dissenting judges. If, if you ever want to read, this won't bore you as much as the Canada Health Act, read the, both the majority and the dissenting decisions in Sheuli. I mean, they were, going at it. I mean, this was, this was like an unfiltered pissing match, to tell you the truth. You guys don't know what you're talking about. Can't you read the evidence? You guys are out to lunch. I mean, what were you thinking? It was, it's re it was, uh, w which is great, actually. It was great to see such a heated, uh, um, in many ways, principled, this bizarre uh, contest of wills. So, uh, all of which is to say, um, I think the charter, one of the unintended consequences of the charter is that it can promote people to worry less about the collective nature of health and health care and distributive justice and focus more on, I have a need, I don't think it's being met, and I'm going to use every vehicle I can, including the charter, to try to get it, which, if successful, uh, can actually make it more difficult to for, to, for public policymakers and resource allocation to do, quote unquote, the greatest good for the greatest number. And it's the old balance between utilitarianism and rights-based thinking and where that lands is always going to be different. But it's a further complexity, it strikes me, in there too. And I guess all I'd say is, if you're going to read Shaoli, read the uh, factum of the Charter Committee on Poverty Issues for the countervailing view about what the Charter is supposed to say. Sure. I guess in support of my pitch for the Canada Health Act is evident. So I've got, I'll pass it on to Colleen. Stephen, that was great. Thanks a lot. Um, I think uh, I just I I wonder about your ultimate conclusions uh, from a comparative perspective, because. Uh, provinces surely have the option, as you said, to have pharmacare, uh, dental care, how about mental health, um, who knows what the future holds, you know, robotics, etc. But they don't. And internationally, that is odd, right? So other jurisdictions uh, do. So it can't, it doesn't seem to me that the fiscal problem that you that that we have is any greater or less than many other countries in the world struggle with so there must be something else going on um, and I wonder I do think that it is to do with the Canada Health Act uh, its limitations and also to do with federalism and the transfer um, or lack of transfer payments to the provinces such that for the provinces in and of themselves, they're you know, up to around 50% of total health care, of total spending going to health. And that makes any kind of reform, even though it might look wise on paper, very difficult to do because somehow they've got to find the cash to roll it out in the first place, even if in the longer run they're going to save money. So I think I disagree with you, I hate to say that, uh, on your ultimate conclusion, because I think that there is something different going on in Canada, 
And it isn't just a different fiscal situation. It is a result of federalism, and it is as a result of the Canada Health Act. Um, I think uh, the Canada Health Act, what, you know, there are these more general principles there of comprehensiveness and accessibility, uh, and this is the second point I, I make. I think it does have value, it does have strength, because at least for extra billing and user charges, it actually holds the federal government's feet to the fire as well. It, it requires the federal government, even although it's mostly ignored these days, does actually, it, it could possibly be enforced through the courts. No one's quite figured out how to do it yet. But it could be enforced that they are forced to, uh, uh, they are forced to enforce their own legislation. And that's actually what, how the BC case came to pass was because a bunch of nurses brought an action against the BC government to force them to enforce their own bans on extra billing. Uh, this has sort of backfired, but that's another story. But there is, you know, legislation isn't just um, uh, rhetorical, I think, in this space. It can actually hold people to account for what they, you know, so it makes them walk the walk and not talk, talk, just talk the talk. And I think that is actually a very important thing uh, and that uh, that's why it's actually essential that we modernize the Canada Health Act, not um, assume that it's really, it's just a worthless piece of paper. Well, thanks. And, uh, we, we, will, we, will, we will disagree on both counts. The first one is my diagnosis of Canada's uniqueness is that we are hopeless at enacting the reforms to the system that every report endorses. We have 50 years of virtually consensus reports with a few minor exceptions, what we need to do to make our healthcare system better and get better value for money, and we do none of it. Because among other things, I mentioned the July 23rd, 1962 compromise. I would say arguably we have the most autonomous and unaccountable physician practice of any country in the world. So essentially the deal is I set up practice as a mini entrepreneur, I serve you in any way I choose, the state pays me, that's it. There's no quality management, there's no collective responsibility for addressing variation in practice, there are no mechanisms for decision support to make prescribing better. We're, we are we are the worst in terms of value for money. The Commonwealth Fund ranks our system 10th of 11 uh, uh, rich OECD countries in health system performance. And we're, we're, we only beat the states and thereby a lash. So that is partly the, the reason why we have a fiscal problem. Other countries, as Colleen points out, they cover way more with the same amount of public spending. Uh, they just do a better job of it. They have lower prices and they have more efficient ways of delivering the care. So our failure is one of public policy and fighting the battles that need to be fought in order to make the system truly more integrated and truly more efficiency finding and truly more equitable. I don't dispute the point about, sure, at the last resort, it's good to have the Canada Health Act so you can force governments to put their own feet to the fire to do the accounting properly. But when it gets to that stage, you've already got a problem. I mean, if, if you have to invoke it, yes, it's good that you can, but it's not going to have a giant impact on what takes place in healthcare because you've already got, you've already got a problem. You've already shown that there is a lack of solidarity, a lack of commitment, and worrisome departures from the spirit of what Medicare is about. So yes, by all means, rein it in. By all means, I'm for fighting the, the litigation, pursuing litigation when, when you have to do it. But I actually think that uh, it's the second best way to get justice done. I think it's better to say to the public, you're gonna lose this thing if you're not vigilant. It's not, no victories are permanent in public policy. And if you don't connect the dots that if they cut your taxes, if government gets out of providing a lot of public service, if you're encouraged to think that the public system doesn't do a great job and that the private system will be better, and if people go down that road and down that road, at the end of the day, you've, you're putting this, this kind of thing at risk. I don't think Canada's there yet, but I think you can erode it by stealth. 
And I think by saying, you know, all we need to do is put some teeth into a modernized Canada Health Act and all will be better, I think is very optimistic, to say the least. I'm also very optimistic, uh, and I'm one of those autonomous, unaccountable uh, physicians. Um, and my area of research, I know, I'm very short. <laughs> and I'm very short. Uh, my area of research is also performance measurement, so I very much agree with you. However, I did train in the United States, so I have a very good sense of what it's like to live under very accountable rules. Um, I'm optimistic because I think that governments should lead, but I'm realistic because I'm a family physician. I think that you have to work with the people you work with. and. I wonder if the Canada Health Act has done a tremendous job in establishing a culture in this country. Over the last two years, the Canadian Medical Association has done a lot of consultation and found that Canadians believe there's a minimum standard of care for Canadians, and they enforce it for themselves. This is uh, you know, uh, personal evidence here. Everybody will fight for their own minimum standard. It becomes very uh, uh, you know, upset when their own health care is compromised. But we have an extraordinary tolerance for inequity in, in the face of obvious uh, violation of this supposed minimum standard. How does this coexist? And I wonder if it's because the Canada Health Act has given us sort of a, a false uh, sense of moral comfort? Well, I, I think that's a fabulous point. And again, subject probably for another talk, but in a sense, I think Canada has over-invested its social and political capital in healthcare and underinvested it in other forms of social programming. So we beat our breasts to say, we've got Medicare. We're not like those ugly Americans who leave 40 million uninsured, although they're making some inroads in there. So aren't we virtuous? But that seems to be where it ends. So we have a housing crisis in this country. We have a homelessness problem in this country. And here's the irony, what used to be kind of a reluctant, usually eroding partner in Medicare, the CMA, is now the most progressive organization in the country in many ways, right? They're the ones calling for the senior strategy. Our autonomy is at stake. You're at, yeah, sh sh well, it, it, but it's not just that. I think there is actually a, a, a social justice movement in medicine that didn't exist 30 years ago to the same extent that it does now, and I think if you, if you see younger stu young medical students and so on, I mean, they're kind of remind me of the 60s generation. You know, they're pretty idealistic compared to what they used to be. So they're not all gonna become dermatologists. And this is, th this, this is, this is a, a, a great thing. The, the question is then, okay, if you think it's going to take tens of billions more dollars to fix Medicare, I don't. I don't think it's ever been a money problem. I think it's been how we use the money and we continue to get bad value for money. But if you say, well, let's expand, let's do pharmacare, let's put more billions in, well, from a logical perspective, I would say, let's do it. I say, well, is that where you'd put your next $10 billion in public money? I would say, no, it isn't, actually. I'd put it in other places. And I say, we do have enormous equity problems in access to a range of health services, not all of which are health care services, and that's, that's the next frontier, I think. And I think that's a reasonable thing to debate. I wish the debate were about that, really. I don't think it is in, in government circles. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Stephen. A very useful talk. Um, and, and I have to disclose my bias here, and I'm probably the only person in the room, but I fully support Dr. Day, and I hope he wins his lawsuit, a in large part because it may actually cause some, some real change if, if he happened to win. The governments would have to take note and do something. But, but that's not what I, I wanted to talk about. It seems to me that one of the biggest threats that, uh, that we face uh, in, in terms of the public system in, Ontari in Ontario is the, the runaway spending by this government. We're, we're now the largest uh, subnational borrower in the world. Um, the government has these deficit plans going 10 years forward, and, and I think that the day of reckoning in Ontario may come very quickly, uh, and it's going to have a big impact on health care, and, and I wonder why people who, who support public health care aren't taking aim at the, at the current government to say, you know, health care coverage is in jeopardy with the, with the uh, spendthrift plans that uh, 
you've been running with for the last 10 years? Well, governments from time to time run into big fiscal problems. My province in 1991 was literally on the edge of bankruptcy, by which I mean that the bond rating agencies in New York were about to downgrade the government of Saskatchewan to junk bond status, which means we wouldn't have been able to borrow money to pay current obligations. The left-wing socialist government of Roy Romano fixed the Conservatives' fiscal performance painfully, painfully, including cutting health care, by the way. So you can fix it. But the other thing is, which is I think the Canadian issue, we may or may not have an expenditure problem. We may also have a revenue problem. Remember, governments deliberately have foregone billions and tens of billions of dollars in income tax revenue, far below, th the rates are far below those which you would reasonably need to be competitive on any grounds. Absolutely the case. So you could say the government's spendthrift and wasteful. If you look objectively at about health care in Ontario, you have the most efficient hospital system in Canada. Absolutely. You know, you, you use the fewest beds and you have the lowest cost per capita in terms of hospitals. So. It's not like Ontario has a horribly, obviously inefficient health care system. It does have a big fiscal problem. And, and I think, you, you, yes, at some point the chickens come home to roost on that. But again, revenue, expenditures, health care efficiency, there are three elements of the issue, and I think they all need to be addressed. Uh, my other point on the pharmacare. It seems to me that when this uh, topic gets discussed and, and, and how reform might take place, that, that nobody looks at how the, how the current system is financed, which is that it, it's largely paid for by employers who, who get a tax deduction for the <coughs> amounts they pay for premiums, and, and, and that, that is not a taxable benefit in, in the hand of employees. And, and, and I raise that because it seems to me if there's going to be change, then these benefits are going to become taxable. Well, and and and, and maybe that's the uh, uh, the the issue that that the the the, uh, the ruling group is not prepared to look at because all of a sudden people who've had these plans for all of these years are, are at the end of the year are now going to find out I've got three thousand dollars or more in imputed income and no cash to pay the tax on it, um, and, and so that's. Uh, I mean, I, I don't see that issue ever coming up. I don't see people raising it when they talk about the current pharmacare plan and, and the changes that are necessary to sure. perhaps uh, achieve well, better coverage. Okay, but the root cause is people like me, people like elderly people, people in non-unionized environments or non who don't work in large companies are subsidizing people in big companies and the public sector by giving them ta benefits that aren't taxable, and they're allowing corporations to get a tax deduction for doing this. This is preposterous from a justice point of view. Well, well I don't see why the tech corporations should get taxes. It's an expenditure that they're undertaking on behalf of their employees. Well, but, someone well, should pay tax on but, it. But I think maybe right. the employee should pay tax on the benefit. Uh, well, but again, th those who advocate universal pharmacare would say, why are employers in this business anyway? This is crazy. You know, you're in the business of making stuff, and providing goods and services. Why should we conscript you into providing health care? It, it impedes mobility of, of labor, for one thing, because people won't move because of their benefits and so on and so forth. It forces them to try to be experts in something that they're not. They end up with a bunch of overhead with third-party insurers who exert no quality control over any of this. It's just a benefit. It is just a flow through. Basically, it's a joke, third, the way Canadian third-party uh, drug insurance works. So advocates of Universal would say the whole thing is a house of cards. And yes, you're right about some parts of that, but that's kind of a symptom of a much bigger problem, which is why I mean, American companies are dragged to their knees by being up to their necks in health care. We we're up to our, ours are up to their thighs in health care. It's better in the view of some, get them out of the business. Well, what, a, what about uh, if we have pharmacare, then what about dental? Because wouldn't there be still dental plans at work? Well, I mean, we can't, be. we, can't, we can't afford that. Uh, 
well, level of coverage. The, you, the you, question you have of affordability to is who pays? Yeah. We all pay at the end. There's only one payer in the end, us, the citizens. It's whether yeah. we do it through the vehicle of government and public services or through intermediaries. I'm not saying that it's an obvious answer, but it's yeah. not like it's cheaper in one than the other. Ultimately, it comes home to roost, right? Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Stephen. And before the uh, the next question, I just want to quickly interject that uh, Marc Andre Gagnon will be coming to the law school to speak in my health law class, and I know I'm I'm going to ask Rosemary to publicize that. So you're certainly welcome to come and attend that because that's a whole other very interesting debate. Okay, I just want to thank you again uh, for your talk. Uh, that was very interesting. Um, I had a comment to make, and I don't know if, if what you might think of this, but uh, a while ago, I don't rem remember exactly the date, um, CBC News broadcast had that s had a survey run where Canadians voted Tommy Douglas as the um, you know their favorite Canadian of all time. Right. So I think I'm uh, my point is that I'm not sure if the Canada Health Act and Medicare in general has lost its allure even for our generation, and I think that we might be actually more in tune with with the with the way the society is headed and we might be actually ready to carry the banner and take it forward so i'm just wondering like uh you mentioned that our generation might be less kind of aware of 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 the battle that was fought for medicare i'm wondering uh you know if if that's really true i guess well you may be i think you're probably less aware of the battle i'm not saying that you are not more socially or, or politically inclined for towards collective action i mean Political, the political winds change. Nothing is eternal. I detect in younger people uh, a more social democratic lean, if I say, than, than you would have seen 20 years ago. I think the Alberta election is an example of that. Uh, and and the, if you look at civic politics, you know, it's young people elected Nenshi and Abison, uh, the, uh, the mayors of Edmonton and Calgary who are very progressive and so on. So yeah, it, it's true. I, I think what this is all about for the public is connecting the dots. If you want more comprehensive, publicly financed services, you're going to have to pay for them. That means you're going to have to tolerate probably higher taxes. It's not just health care. It's infrastructure. It's the cost. If it, you know, do, we, do we charge students a greater and greater proportion of their university education uh, because we're no longer prepared to subsidize it so much publicly. All of these things have equity consequences, distributional consequences, and tax consequences. And it's not for me to tell society what it ought to do. My only plea is that it be coherent. You can't say we should have great, we should pave all the highways every two years and we should repair all the roofs in the university buildings, but we're not raising taxes. That's just crazy thinking. It's just incoherent. And no family could get away with that kind of economics. So the debate is really how much of the quality of life of av the average Canadian is dependent on public services. And I would argue a lot of it is, more than we tend to think of every day. And when you have a minimalist government, what do they tend to do? They tend to defer things. They, they defer maintenance. Just in the University Hospital in Saskatoon, which is 400 beds, the estimated cost of repairing this 40-year-old building is $400 million because nobody spent any money on it. Every university I know of has a giant capital deficit impending because the buildings are not being maintained. We're not paying it forward, as the saying goes. And the debate should be exactly about that. So. Um, and you know, it may be people decide we don't care. That's we, we prefer the, the the life we have with l relatively low taxes, foregone government revenues, and less activist government. Fine, that's fine if you take the consequences. That's the only thing th th that I would suggest is at, at play here. Um, so I'm a first year uh, law student, which means um, I'm hoping that Professor Flood and Hardcastle are going to make this completely clear to me by the end of it. Um, but I also have 11 years as a strategy and change consultant in healthcare um, before I decided to become crazy and come to law school. Um, and I guess I'm wondering where uh, two things, scope and accountability, come into play here when we talk about 
levels of government and and legislation that's 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 being passed. Because first of all, we're talking about health care, and uh, you know, as outlined on your your slide, the Canada Health Act is is you know it's acute care. Um, so you know, w what is health care in Canada today? And by the way, is it like one word or two? Um, and and you know what what do we do with that and and who you know over onto the, we've got expanding technologies we've got uh, people who want focus on preventative health and you know decreased spending efficiencies whatever uh, none of this is provided by the Canada Health Act and then we have accountability all over the place so we've got docs accountable to the CMA we've got you know billings going through provinces we've got. CEOs of you know uh, hospitals in Ontario that that you know work up through you know uh, maybe the lens involved maybe it isn't you know we've got other things in other provinces where you know we're going through to health authorities that are you know accountable to provinces where are the clear lines so as a public we can even understand what the system is today versus where do we need to go well I mean that's a giant question and I don't have an answer what I would say is governments through commissions, reports, high-level stuff, it's been proven they have a very limited capacity to actually improve the healthcare system. This is an organizational and a professional responsibility. And I think personally what I would hope governments would do would be to unleash some creativity by taking some significant size communities and saying we're going to bundle all of these things together and we're going to make you a health organization. Here's your money. Go to it. Fix primary care. Move care upstream. Do your intersectoral stuff with social and other agencies in order to deal with difficult populations. It can't be worse. <laughs> It'll probably be better. And just be guarantee a certain stable level of funding. It doesn't really matter what the level of funding is. We have a lot of money in this system. I'm sure we can do better with it, and I think the experimentation and the, and the improvement has to be actually closer to the community and the ground. And the government, of course, can steer to a certain extent, but it can't oversteer. It's a total failure as a micro micromanager, and it overestimates its capacity to understand these things and underestimates the constraint that it imposes by rules and pseudo accountability that doesn't accomplish much. S Stephen, on behalf of the center, the law school, and everyone present, I'd like to thank you for a really excellent presentation, and we look forward to seeing you this evening at the bar. Thank you. So please uh, grab a sandwich or a cookie as you as you go.